Uh, were they shot? Yes. They were shot? Yes. What happened? <laughs> what happened? Who is the person that was shot? <laughs> my mom and my dad. Your mom and dad? My mom and my dad. Let me read you a quote. One of the misconceptions is that I did not love my father or love my mother. That is the farthest thing from the truth. I miss my mother tremendously. And this was said by Eric Menendez, who blew his mother's head off with a shotgun. So yeah, never listen to what people say. Just watch what they do because behaviors don't lie as the saying goes. So we're going to take a deep dive into the Menendez case, a 1989 case. And the reason why this case is getting the light of day again is because of a Los Angeles DA named George Gascon. This man just could not let it go. So he recently stated about the boys, he says, they have respectively served 34 years and have continued their education and worked to create new programs to support the rehabilitation of fellow inmates. And in short, Gascon is asking for clemency, which is just a fancy word for mercy. Okay, so he wants the boys to go back to court for a resentencing. The boys got, I believe, double life and no parole. But he wants to resentence them to just 50 years. He filed the papers on October 25th of 2023. So the brothers will now go before a Los Angeles Superior Court judge for a final decision. Now, I'm not going to say that I agree with resentencing. I will go as far as to say that this is a very complicated case. Okay, it takes you on an emotional roller coaster that you actually think you'd never go on. But just keep this in mind. It took a mistrial, three sets of jurors, and I think it was like a month and a half if you combine them all together of deliberation to finally get a verdict to this case. So yeah, it is a complicated case. And I would definitely love to hear what you guys, or what side you guys are on after hearing all the evidence of this case. Now, before we take that deep dive into the Menendez case, I wanna give a quick shout out to Carlos for being our latest Patreon member. Much love, hopefully I can make your $5 worth it. And if you guys would like to support me in the simplest way possible, just hit the like button, leave me a message. I love corresponding with you guys and it helps the YouTube algorithm to share the video, right? So now let's go ahead and take a deep dive into the Menendez case, everything you guys need to know before this resentencing. Jose Enrique Menendez, he was nothing less than a Cuban American success story and his backstory is quite fascinating. He comes from a lineage of remarkable athletes. His great grandfather is in the Cuban Hall of Fame for sports and is considered by some as their greatest uh, baseball player. His father, he is Jose Menendez Pavone, and we'll only refer to him as Jose Sr. to avoid confusion. His mother was previously Maria Carlota Yenio, and she was no slouch in athletics herself. She won five gold medals in the 1935 Central American and Caribbean Olympics, and she was also inducted into the Cuban Hall of Fame for sports as a star swimmer. Now, Jose Sr. and Maria, their upbringing was very humble. It's very cute. They were next door neighbors that fell in love and would marry in 1938. And every two years for the next six years, they would pop out a little one. In 1940, they had Derecita. In 1942, they had another daughter named her Marta. And on May 6th of 1944, their son, Jose Enrique Menendez was born. And as you could imagine, coming from a long line of high achievers, especially in the realm of athletics, high expectations were set upon these kids, especially that of young Jose. Jose was very bright, he was very smart, and he was terrifically energetic, that's how he was described. And he was leaps above the other kids in terms of smarts and physicality, and was well aware of it, which made him incredibly arrogant about it and according to his sisters it didn't help that their mother babied young jose to the point where it seemed that little jose could do no wrong the sisters remembered that every time they did something wrong you know they would be punished for it and uh, every time jose did something wrong well the results were quite different and soon they had an inside joke and started calling him mother's cute boy for the simple fact that when jose did something it wasn't wrong it was cute. 
So growing up, Jose ran track and even dabbled in the American style of football. His youth would be disrupted in 1959 when the new prime minister, Fidel Castro, took power. Now, Castro would begin teaching revolutionary propaganda material in the schools and Jose, he was only 15 at the time, but he was already becoming this outspoken critic of Castro to the point where his family and friends feared that he would be kidnapped by Castro's regime or arrested. So early on, we could already see the hallmark of Jose's personality. You know, when he had something on his mind, you know, a particular thing mixed with his tremendous work ethic, you had this pit bull that would bite down and never let go. And so since their cute boy was adamant about cursing out a dictator publicly, their mother Maria, she became incredibly afraid for her son's life. And in 1960, Jose would find himself on a flight to America. And if this sounds abrupt, it's because it was. He literally was uprooted overnight from his comfortable life in Havana and was now living in Pennsylvania with Travis and Georgie Cox, people he had never met, but they were distant cousins. And Travis and Georgie, they remembered housing Jose, and they recalled that he would never leave his room. And when he did, he would use the bathroom, eat, and never utter a word. Now, mind you, he didn't know English at this point. And also, they, he would just lock himself in the attic at times because there was a shortwave radio up there, and he was using it in hopes of catching some news, you know, from his home in Cuba. So obviously he was worried sick about his family and, you know, the state of his country. He was angry, he was depressed, he was homesick. And if I had to choose a point, you know, where Jose Enrique Menendez chose not to be a victim, i probably choose this time here because he channeled his anger into a goal, you know, to one day return to Havana and fight against the revolution. A lofty and probably impossible goal, but because he had a goal, you know, he couldn't just sit around. So he started picking up English and he learned it quite quickly. But once he spoke well enough to have conversations with the other kids, he was then bullied for having what they called a Ricky Ricardo accent. And if you know who that is, then you know. He then joins the swim team. Now, don't forget that he is physically gifted, all right? His DNA dictates that he is heads above the rest and literally and figuratively, he blows everybody out of the water in swimming. He silenced all the haters by being the strongest swimmer in his school, becoming a star. And of course, this is a far cry from toppling a communist regime, but he would continue to work very hard in school and he would tell anyone that would listen that he will become successful and famous someday. And of course, if you saw his tenacity, you'd be a fool not to believe him. So back in Cuba, people were starting to flee the country any way they could. Jose's two sisters, they were pregnant now and had already left for Miami. Now, Jose Sr. and Maria, they did not leave with their daughters. They were going to weather this storm. They didn't want to leave their homeland, perfectly understandable. But Maria, she would eventually miss her children and she wanted to see her grandchildren when they were born. So she decided to go to America, but Jose Sr., he was unmoved and vowed to stay behind. But eventually, Jose Sr.'s mind would be made up for him when Castro's army came to seize everything he had worked his entire life for. And by 1962, Jose Sr. was on a plane to Miami as well. So now the whole family is in America and Cuba is just a remnant of their past. Jose continued to be dominant in swimming for the remainder of his school year, earning him a scholarship to Southern Illinois University. Mary Louise Anderson was born on October 23rd in 1941 in Oak Lawn, Illinois. Now she's simply known as Kitty and she was the youngest child of Andy and Lula Mae Anderson's four children, which included two brothers, Brian and Milton, and a sister named Joan. Now, her father, Andy, owned a commercial refrigeration and air conditioning business, which afforded them a nice large house, you know, for the family to live in the Chicago suburbs. Her mother, Mae, she had always dreamed of becoming a concert pianist, but the dream was dashed because Andy wanted a stay-at-home wife. And unfortunately, the only way Andy figured to achieve this 
was to abuse his wife. He would abuse the children verbally and physically as well, trying to rule the house with an iron fist. And thank goodness for May that when it came to her children, she would not just sit around and watch Andy hurt them. And Joan, who was the oldest of the four kids, she recalled that her mother would come to their rescue every time their father tried to hurt the children. And so in turn, he would wind up hurting their mother instead. And when Andy, I guess, finally realized that he couldn't just rule as he wanted to rule, that he couldn't just freely impose his will on his own family, the coward left and he filed for divorce and he left them. And Kitty at the time, she was just this wee little thing and she remembered seeing her mother cry herself to sleep the night that her father had left. So it was a dysfunctional upbringing for Kitty and her siblings to say the least. So as the years would go on, May would try to raise the kids as best she could. And by the time Kitty reached high school, she had really grown into her looks and became the pretty girl in school. She was very popular and even had a group of girls she hung out with and called themselves the Party Dolls, which I'll assume well, it wasn't corny then. And her looks, they would make her very popular with the boys, of course. And once she was out of high school, her looks would even win her the Oak Lawn Beauty Pageant which was in 1962. So during this time, she was attending the Southern Illinois University, majoring in communications, and she was hoping to become either an actress and or as well some broadcasting work. Joan recalled Kitty telling her how smitten she was with this handsome, exotic foreigner in her philosophy class named Jose. Now, Joan said that Kitty and Jose, when she saw them together, that they had this beautiful relationship. They told her that they had found their one, their number one, and that was it. And just a year later, on July 8th of 1963, the couple got married. Jose and Kitty began their life by renting a small apartment in Queens, New York. Now, Jose wasn't a great student at SIU at all. He was much too distracted, probably by women. But now he's married and he knew he had responsibilities. So once he enrolled uh, himself in Queens College for accounting, he was locked in. And I don't say that lightly because Jose did not like being cash strapped. And worse, a cash strapped newlywed with his gorgeous wife in want of money. So by day, he was washing dishes at a club as well as bookkeeping for a chicken farm, a chicken wholesaler, and would take night school for accounting. Now, Kitty, she wants to do her part. Remember, her dream was broadcasting or being an actress, but she wound up getting a teaching job at a school in the Bronx. Kitty could have gotten those jobs that she wanted, you know, in the fields that she actually graduated for, but here's probably where you'll look at Jose a bit differently because he didn't want his wife in those fields because he felt that broadcasting was only for men. And this is New York in the 60s. And even then, the rent was too damn high because I read in the book that Kitty and Jose, they ate a lot of salty ham. And on those cold nights, they would simply leave the oven open, which I don't know how that saves energy, but maybe they were just burning coal back in those days. I'm not too sure how they kept warm in the 60s. But here's the interesting thing about these trying times for Kitty and Jose, at least in Kitty's perspective. These would be the incredibly fond memories for Kitty. As we all know, she came from a broken family. The man she married actually turned out to be a chauvinist, not dissimilar to her dad, and maybe that's what she expected men to be like. So it was okay. Regardless, she was happy because she felt incredibly close to Jose during those times and considered it the happiest times of their marriage, which of course is kind of a spoiler on how the marriage would go in the future. So Jose would graduate in 1967 in the top 10% of his class, majoring in economics and accounting. And the first job that he applied for 
they took him right away. He was now part of big eight accounting firm of Coopers and Lybrand, and his starting pay was $25,000, which is roughly $140,000 today. But an interesting thing happened when big eight sent Jose to Chicago to help one of their clients called Lions Container Services. He discovered that Lions Books were in shambles. He was able to pinpoint, you know, where the problems were that were careening this company into bankruptcy. And so Jose offered them this restructuring plan. It highlighted the fact that their comptroller needed to be fired immediately. The company was so impressed, you know, by this plan, by this young accountant, that they basically stole Jose away from Big Eight by offering him three times more money which is $400,000 today. So it was a no-brainer for Jose. Uh, they fired their comptroller and put Jose in his position. I don't know if that was his ulterior motive this whole time. Next thing you know, Kitty is quitting her teaching job and now the Menendez are moving to Chicago. For Lion Containers, hiring Jose was the best thing they ever could have done because with Jose at the helm as comptroller, he was able to raise their revenue from $2.8 million to a whopping $5.2 million. And by the third year, it had climbed to $12 million. And because Lion Containers could now boast this healthy profit margin, they would sell the company and the new company that took over let Jose go. But there was no need to shed any tears for Jose because he would pick up a new job in no time for the exact same salary again at $75,000 a year, 400K today, from Hertz Renacar as director of operations. And if you think you know Jose now, even the chauvinistic part, you're about to see another side of Jose again, and you might not like it. Now, mind you, he is brilliant and nobody could deny that. And it sort of made him insufferable. So within the next two years at working at Hertz, he was promoted to executive vice president of the car and commercial leasing division, where Jose would present to CEO Bob Stone a blueprint of what he thought he needed to change about the division. And to the CEO, it seemed rather drastic what Jose was presenting him, which led him to say, you're either brilliant or an idiot. To which Jose responded, fire me if I'm an idiot. So Jose wasn't playing any games here. He wasn't trying to win a popularity contest with the employees under him. He was here to do a job and he was going to do it to the best of his abilities, which meant personnel had to be reassigned to areas that they would be more effective, demotions, and if needed be, he would just fire people. And because of this, Jose would cut costs dramatically, which is every owner's dream. He was loved, absolutely adored by the people at the top, but he was completely hated by those that worked under him. He would have these exhaustive meetings where it was described as a no holds barred. Jose would just go on about his ideas, his plans, berating his colleagues, and then on and on and on about something else. And at this point, we start to get the idea that maybe Jose simply just loved the sound of his own voice. At least that's what the employees thought. <laughs> So there was zero compassion for those that he considered his subordinates. And he wasn't beneath name calling or using sarcasm to belittle people. If you annoyed him, he would relentlessly mock you. If he felt the slightest resistance of a command that he gave, he would make sure that you would never do it again by confronting you in front of everyone for God knows how long until he felt you got the point. He had a superiority complex, it sounds like, right? And his favorite saying around the office was, then what are we paying you for? And the people were scared of losing their jobs, right? They had families to feed. And so they just put up with him. So now that their finances had greatly improved, Jose and Kitty began to focus on having a family of their own. On January 10, 1968, Joseph Lyle Menendez was born in a Brooklyn hospital and just three years later on November 27, 1971, Eric Galen Menendez was born in a New Jersey hospital. And once both sons were born, Jose decided to take a pretty big risk in his career. So Hertz Renicar, 
is actually a subsidiary of Radio Corporation of America what we know as RCA and they would have a records division records division meaning music division to the young kids they used to have these big black round things that were called records so Jose ventured out of his comfort zone and entered the music industry and this pivot would actually prove very lucrative because by the 1980s he was the chief operating officer at RCA records and he had various top artists under contract you know the most notable at the time being Duran Duran he would also take a chance on this Latin group called Menudo and from my understanding Menudo is kind of like this revolving door boy band where you enter at 12 and you age out at 16 I believe Ricky Martin was once part of the band Menudo. Now, I harp on Menudo a bit because it will become a compelling factor when it comes to how you're going to view the verdict, so keep Menudo in mind. So, Jose Menendez is now filthy rich. He moves his family into a million dollar four bedroom split level estate with a man-made lake in their backyard in Princeton, New Jersey. The boys would grow up as privileged as anybody can be, right? They went to a prestigious daycare. They went to prestigious private schools. They were handed everything they could ever want, spoiled every step of the way, but there was a cost. And those were those lofty expectations that Jose would set upon his boys and they were set incredibly high. They needed to excel in academics, in athletics. They had to be successful or face the ire of their parents. Growing up, they were instilled with a strong sense of guilt if they didn't live up to what was expected. And thank goodness that the brothers were able to find comfort in each other while they were growing up, which created this strong bond between the two. Now, Lyle, being the older brother, he really looked out for his little brother, Eric. You know, friends would come and go, but the brothers always had each other to count on, which is definitely what you want as a parent. Now, in terms of parental treatment, older brother Lyle had a lot more expectations placed on his shoulders from academics down to even his looks. Lyle had to take the brunt of uh, Jose's demeaning insults because he was the older brother and he had to be the example for his little brother to replicate. Image was everything to Jose. They had to be the Joneses. You know, when Lyle started losing his hair at just 14 years old, this bothered Jose more than it bothered Lyle, who was losing the hair. He made Lyle wear a toupee when they were out in public because he needed his family to look perfect. He wanted everyone to be envious of the Menendez family. So Jose pretty much ran his house like he ran his companies and spared no feelings in getting his wife and kids to become what he felt that they should be. You know, whatever his parents instilled in him was amazing for success. But it also made him this unbearable person to be around. His business acumen basically mirrored his family life. You know, like the higher-ups, his parents, his bosses, you know, they would love him because he brought them results and made them proud. While the people that were under him, Kitty, the boys, his employees, found him insufferable because they were the ones that actually had to deal with him. And from birth, Jose's kids were more of a centerpiece you know, I would say, to represent how successful he was, and that's why he needed them to succeed. Now, remember, Jose himself did not attend an Ivy League school, and throughout his entire career, that was, a, I guess, a thorn in his side, something that he desperately hid from everyone, and it was a source of shame for him. So when he had his sons, he had already set in his mind that they were going to an Ivy League school and even picked one out for them, Princeton. He made sure that Lyle and Eric not only knew the value of money, but how important it was to have a lot of it. So when money is stressed so much to children all their lives, they're going to think that money is everything. That's a pretty skewed perception, especially when the boys had every dollar they could ever want. So let's do the math. Money is everything. And the kids are thinking, I have money, which equals I have everything. So when you take money away from the Menendez boys, you are taking away everything. 
Now, to the majority of us, I could safely assume we did not grow up rich. So when we see boys like Lyle and Eric who seem to have everything, we think spoiled brats, right? And that would be just a surface level observation, a surface level bias. And if you knew that once Lyle became of driving age, he didn't ask his dad for a Corolla. He immediately asked his dad for a Porsche. That was the first car he wanted. And then we're like, yeah, of course, definitely. Spoiled brat. But once I dove deeper into the case, I definitely, as you will see, I'd rather have grown up poor and happy. In 1987, Jose decided to leave the music industry and venture into the movie industry. He packs up the family and heads to Hollywood and moves into the upscale neighborhood of Calabasas. He begins working at a company called Live Entertainment, which, although it was a new company, it was already dying of debt. But as we have learned about Jose, this was his specialty. He was like the Superman to these dying companies because within the first year, he increased profits by $8 million. But of course, along the way, he was his old, insufferable self amongst his employees. And by the end of his second tenure there, he increased profits another twofold to $16 million. So what could anybody say about results like that, right? The results were short of amazing. So the company named him their CEO with a base salary of $500,000 a year, which is good for us today in 2024. That was $1.4 million in today's money that Jose was raking in every year. And that's not even considering the numerous bonuses along the way. For the Menendez boys, their father was a true American success story. They really had everything they could ever need and almost everything they wanted. But in parallel with their father's rising star was the growing pressures of being their father's son. Now, Lyle, being the older brother, you know, was carrying most of the weight and those high expectations. But that didn't mean that Eric didn't feel every bit of the pressure to the point that he was throwing up from time to time because of this pressure. They represented the family and everything they did. Now, if the boys learned tennis, which they did, then the boys had to become nationally ranked, which they did. Eric was especially gifted in this sport and he played very hard and he even dreamed of going pro. He would even rank 44th in the nation of teenagers. And that's a tremendous amount of dedication to achieve what the boys did. And we would honestly think that that would make Jose proud. And it probably did. But it was always only just for a little while. The boys would wear their status like a badge of honor in school. But it was quite sad to read that it was more of a facade, you know, for their peers. Because the two boys, to themselves, never really had much confidence. And they struggled with self-esteem issues because nothing ever seemed enough for their father, for Eric. He struggled with it much more than Lyle did. And it goes to show that when you protect someone from the realities of the world, then you, at the same time, hinder their abilities to cope with it. Lyle shielded his little brother, but when their father's expectations bore down on him, it made him a ball of anxiety. And like a lot of adolescents struggling with emotions that they don't fully grasp just yet, the interesting thing they would do is rebel. And the boys, they really rebelled. So one night, the boys and a few of their friends, you know, they decided to rob a house in their wealthy neighborhood of Calabasas. Lyle is 18 years old at this point, and Eric is just 15. Now, they're armed with solid information about a safe full of valuables, and one of the boys even had the combinations to that safe. So the boys and a few of their friends broke into this house and made off with tens of thousands of dollars worth of jewelry, money, and pretty much they got away with it. For Lyle and Eric, doing something illegally probably felt really good. It felt like they were going against their father and it felt liberating for them so much so that they decided to rob another house but this time it would just be the menendez brothers and this time 
they came away with a fortune, over $100,000 worth of stuff. It was just the thrill they were chasing at this point, you know? And then word got around school that the Menendez brothers had just done a major lick. One of their friends, the one that provided them with the first robbery, well, he felt betrayed. And so he snitched on them. And as the story goes, Jose would visit the victims to apologize for his boys and he tried to pay them off. You know, not to press charges, to just forget the whole thing. Well, it didn't work. The boys were charged and they wound up paying back the money they stole as well as $11,000 worth of damages. And for the boys, arguably, any punishment the state could give them would probably pale in comparison to what Jose would do to them. Having to deal with their father berating them and of course how stupid they were. Fun fact, Jose knew that the boys were robbing these homes. He was simply allowing it to happen. He in fact was cleaning up after them as some sort of twisted education in self-preservation because he wanted to know if the boys could get into shit but also, more importantly, get themselves out of shit. You see, the two examples that I gave you guys about the boys robbing houses, those were not the only houses that the boys hit. They had quite a few more home invasions under their belt, and Jose was Johnny on the spot to take care of the situations by paying off these homeowners, you know, so that the boys would not get charged with any crimes. Basically, he rectified the situation with a payoff until that final house where the people could not be paid off and the boys would effectively be caught publicly. And of course, Jose, Kitty, they were deeply disappointed. But for Jose, the thing that let him down wasn't the fact that the boys were committing crimes. Getting caught was the problem, not the crime. It made Jose and the Menendez family look bad and there's nothing worse to Jose than looking bad. Now, there's a part in the boys' childhoods that I found interesting. It's on brand with Jose's philosophy on how to raise his kids, but it's also a grim foreshadowing at the same time. So, when the boys were just kids, they went over to their cousin's house and they simply ran amok, tipping things over, being loud, listening to nobody, basically being two terrors, right? Well, Jose's brother-in-law, being that this was his house, he was a little bit concerned about the kid's behavior. And, you know, he let Jose know about it. And to this, Jose responded that he didn't believe in disciplining his boys, because in his own words, they will figure things out themselves. So he didn't really care about what everybody thought about his family. He only cared about what uh, the important humans, you know, in his eyes thought about his family and their opinions because he allowed the boys to be rowdy as kids and he allowed them to rob houses as teenagers, Jose just never fathomed how this method would backfire on him. So going back to the final robbery, where the boys were finally caught, right? So Jose devised a plan in which to keep his sons out of jail. It was basically to keep Lyle out of jail because he was an adult. He was 18 years old, so he had 15-year-old Eric pretty much take the fall for the entire thing, saying that, yeah, Lyle was there, but, you know, he didn't participate or something like that because Lyle would get nothing for his crimes and Eric would get the equivalent of a slap on the wrist, of course. Some community service, and he was assigned a therapist for his behavioral problems. Now, this therapist, his name is Dr. Jerome Ozeal, and he'll play an important role in how this story unfolds. So just keep him in mind. So at this time, the Menendez family's net worth, it was just skyrocketing, okay? So now they're moving to Beverly Hills into a six-bedroom Mediterranean-style mansion that had its own courtyard. It had a tennis court for the boys to practice, a pool, a guest house, and, of course, they're surrounded by celebrity neighbors. And to do something like this in today's money... It would run you $11 million. And it was around this time that the family received even more good news. And it really paid off keeping Lyle out of jail. He was accepted into Princeton University just as his father had planned for him since birth. Now, just to let you know that Lyle, as a student, he was decent too good, but he was never at the top of his class. You know, if he excelled in anything, it would have been sports rather than academics. But is it a surprise? 
since cases of rich people like actress Lori Laughlin to have made half a million dollars in contributions to USC, which turned out to be bribes for her two daughters to get into the university. So getting into Princeton, allegedly, might have been just a rich dad away. But of course, going to an Ivy League school doesn't mean you automatically have an Ivy League brain. His grades were really poor to the point that the school had to put him on what they called an academic probation, simply meaning if he does not pick up his grades, he could be dismissed, expelled from the school altogether. And imagine how that would look for the family, because you better believe Jose was thinking about it for Lyle. Instead of picking up his grades, he got caught up in the party scene, and of course his grades went directly down the toilet. Now, Lyle did attempt to rectify his wrongs, except that the only way he knew how, as he was raised, he was only rectifying it by compounding the wrongs, because to get his grades up, he would plagiarize an entire psychology paper and get caught for it. And we all know how Jose feels about getting caught. And so one day, a pissed off Jose was in the dean's office with his checkbook, you know, ready to make out another bribe, ready to make things right again. But the dean of Princeton was not having it. Lyle would be suspended for the remainder of that entire school year, which infuriated Jose and Kitty. They blamed the school for having suspended him. So now Lyle's just kicking back, you know, enjoying the remainder of the year, doing nothing, of course. What he's good at, maybe a little tennis, you know, to get the, you know, to get the blood flow. And Jose, of course, is not gonna sit back and watch his son become nothing. I mean, wasn't he one of the higher executives at live entertainment? And what's a little good old nepotism? in the workplace. I mean, allegedly LeBron James got Bronny James into the NBA, right? Above more deserving players. And so Jose Menendez would get his son a job at live entertainment. Not only did he get him a job at live entertainment, okay? He pretty much set up a ladder for him to climb if he chose to do so. Just take that first step, Lyle, that's all you gotta do. And you could climb your way to the top. And it was here that Jose's ideas about his son were dashed once again, because this would be the first time that Jose really grasped what all that money, that lack of accountability, and enabling, of course, had really produced. Lyle was lazy. He looked at this gifted ladder that his dad gave him, and he wondered why it wasn't an escalator. He complained a lot, found every moment to stand around and chat with employees, come in late, clock out early, go play tennis. You name the character trait of a bad employee, and Lyle was that. Coworkers would recall working with Lyle as just being awful. He was the poster boy, the literal live version of the spoiled brat that got the job because he was the son of the boss. And every time Lyle was around, people were fed up because people had to pick up the slack because Lyle wasn't about to do shit. And people rightfully resented him. And Eric, he was still in high school. He was still playing tennis and even added a drama class to his schedule, which revealed a hidden talent for acting because he won a prize at his school for being the best actor. And this encouraged him to explore his creative side. So he and another student named Craig Signorelli began to write a screenplay that in hindsight sounds incredibly eerie, okay? It was a play called Friends about a young man who murdered his parents in order to inherit their fortune. Now, a story like that, do I need to say? You know, many would think that might be a little too on the nose, right? A little too close to home, and it would concern his parents, right? But his parents weren't concerned, especially Kitty. You know, she was a big fan of Eric's writing and encouraged him to write even more. And as for Jose, his lack of concern didn't come from Eric's content of his writing. Jose was now occupied with accepting the reality that he had raised two pretty much idiots in his mind. He didn't see in his boys, you know, the same drive that he had when he was growing up because he had the hardships or whatnot, and these boys lap of luxury, and they would probably amount to nothing in his head, you know, nothing more than just living off his money. And Jose was never the kind to bite his lip on expressing, even to his boys, to Lyle and Eric, that he didn't think they were good enough and that he is utterly 
disappointed in the both of them. He took this time to fire Lyle from live entertainment as well. And since Eric was so close to Lyle, well, to Jose, he was on the same path to mediocrity. And in frustration, Jose also expressed his plan to take both the boys out of his will to their face. And of course, this would make the Menendez household, everybody in it, very unhappy. At the rate the boys were going, the things that they were doing, you know, I would assume that the boys thought they could just maybe skate through life on the back of their dad's fortune, possibly, and now it appeared that it was all being taken away from them, okay? Nothing had been taken away from them to this degree before, you know? Imagine how they felt when an entire fortune now that they thought they were entitled to is being taken away. Lyle at this point is 21 years old, an age where you're more aware of who you are and what you could be. And for most of us, we would be working to earn our place, you know, in life. And honestly, in my opinion, Lyle, after being handed everything, his whole life was effectively disabled, okay, in, in that sense by his parents and really had no interest in working to earn anything. You know, all he had to do was look around him, the luxury, the comfort, everything reminded him that he had a safety net. And Eric, he was going down the same path. And the awkwardness and the tension between the family members was even apparent to people that didn't even know them, okay? So the family had chartered this yacht, okay, on August 19th of 1989, so that they could go on a voyage together, you know, a fun family outing. But crew members noticed that if the parents were on one side of the boat, the boys were nowhere near them. They would probably be on the other side of the boat. And during the times that they couldn't avoid each other, maybe during meals or whatnot, you know, not a word was uttered and the tension was thick to the point where it even made the crew members feel a bit awkward about being around them. So this brings us to the following evening of Sunday, August 20th of 1989. The boys had gone to see a movie together and the maid, this was her one day off. And Jose and Kitty decided to make use of that cozy den at the back of their house to watch a movie. They had their vanilla ice cream ready, they had strawberries, and they sunk into their comfortable couch and watched a movie. Around 10 p.m., Jose and Kitty were abruptly interrupted by Lyle barging into the room holding a Mossberg 12 gauge shotgun. He immediately aimed it at his father's face, who in panic looked away and Lyle blew the back of his head off. It spun Jose around back into sitting position and Lyle watched his father's lifeless body slump into the couch. Kitty is in hysterics as Eric then comes in and aimed a shotgun at her, but he couldn't pull the trigger, giving Kitty just a moment to get up and try to escape. But Lyle quickly shot her in the leg, shattering it, and she dropped to the floor just in front of the sofa. The two brothers unloaded the remainder of their bullets into their parents. They then took the time to reload and continued to destroy their bodies. Jose was shot six times and Kitty was shot 10 times. The boys both saved their last shots to blow off each of their parents' kneecaps because they wanted it to look like a kneecapping, which was something that they learned the mafia did. And needless to say, shotgun blasts are incredibly loud. And this was multiple shotgun blasts. So Eric and Lyle, they were ready to have the police kicking down their door at any moment. But even when the dust settled, to their surprise, the police, they never came. The neighbors didn't hear it. They never called the police. So the boys took this time to change to clean up and they hurriedly drove the shotguns up to Mulholland Drive and hid the weapons in some secluded area under some dirt and brushes. They didn't even dig a proper hole to bury the guns. It wasn't hard to unearth, is what I'm trying to say. Now, afterwards, they went to a wine tasting in Santa Monica like nothing ever happened. And when they returned to the house, they frantically called 911. And when the police finally showed up, they recalled the boys appearing extremely traumatized as they ran out of the house hysterically screaming. Eric collapsing on the front lawn and curled up into a ball hyperventilating and Lyle 
taking Eric's lead, dropped to the lawn as well to comfort his little brother. And officers, after what they found in the house, felt that the boy's pain and reaction was genuine. And to be honest, I feel really bad for any of the policemen, detectives, anybody who saw what was left in that den for them to find that night, okay? So it was described as the TV still being on, and it was illuminating pretty much just a room of blood and body parts. The bowl of ice cream that had fallen to the floor, the strawberries strewn about, lying in blood. This scene before was a couple enjoying their Sunday evening. And now they're dead. Their bodies mangled by bullets to the point where they were quoted as being unrecognizable. And once the investigation got underway, the boys would be questioned. Their alibi was that they went to go see a movie called License to Kill, but found out that it was sold out and then they saw Batman instead. And after that, they had dinner and drinks at what was called the Taste of LA Festival. And then they would come home and they would find their parents murdered. And in all the reports, the boy's reaction and alibi were very convincing for detectives. I mean, so much so that they didn't even do the most routine checks, such as test the boy's hands for gunpowder residue. And the kneecapping actually proved very clever because the boys led the detectives down that path by saying that, you know, it was possible that their father was dealing with people in the underworld. You know, simply mentioning that their father did have some shady connections. And so days would pass, and as detectives started to dig deeper into the matter, the mob hit angle just didn't hold much water to the detectives when it came to Jose. Considering the mob usually like to keep things rather clean and quiet if they're gonna do a hit, you know, whereas this was a complete slaughter, a complete massacre. It had personal, written all over it to the detectives. So they started to interview people that had worked for Jose and, you know, kind words were few and far between, yes, but there was no indication to them that someone hated Jose that much in comparison to how brutal these killings were. And also they just couldn't get a bead on why Kitty was killed in the same manner. From everything that they can gather, Kitty was well liked and nobody knew her in any other light than being a devoted wife and a mother and her murder it really didn't make any sense especially in the mob hit angle either because the mob would have just let her live you know they would have taken out jose very cleanly kneecapped him and left there was no need to kill kitty and while all the investigations was going on, Lyo and Eric, they would check themselves into a hotel. Yeah, they said they feared that the mafia would come back to finish the job, I guess. You know, so they hired some bodyguards. They even wore bulletproof vests, right? Really sticking to the script. But there was one problem with this script. No self-respecting writer is going to add, spend your deceased father's money at an alarming rate. So on August 25th was the day of the funeral and the turnout was huge. Around 200 people attended. And let's just say that a lot of people noticed that the brothers, especially Lyle, were immaculately dressed. The brothers' demeanor was considered strange because they did not appear to be in any mourning state considering that it was just five days since they found their parents murdered. Some even suggested that they saw the boys casually snickering and already planning vacations to the U.S. Open Tennis Tournament in New York. And Lyle, he gave a standard eulogy of missing the deceased, sucked back the tears, and when it was all over, went back to spending his dead parents' money. Jose's net worth was estimated at $14.5 million. In today's money... That's roughly $355 million. And just so we can better understand the magnitude of the spending that is about to occur, I'll adjust for inflation into today's money going forward. And if you remember, when Lyle asked his dad for a Porsche when he first got his license, Jose actually never got Lyle that car, which probably burned Lyle up secretly inside because he immediately gets himself that Porsche he asked for and that was $153,000 
off the bat. He would buy a restaurant. I'm sure it's safe to say that Lyle has no idea how to run a restaurant or running any business. He shells out $1.4 million to buy Chuck's Spring Street Cafe and he renames it Mr. Buffalo, which leads me to believe he also sucks at naming restaurants. Now I say this facetiously. It's as if the moment Lyle blew off the back of his father's head, he figured that Jose's IQ, hard work, and determination magically flew into his head because he then opened up the Menendez Investment Enterprise, in which he hired a few friends from his time at Princeton, his short time at Princeton, to come work for him. He was a businessman now. And how did that go? Well, let's take this quick aside, okay, about Lyle's business acumen. One Princeton friend would be promised a certain amount of pay to work at Lyle's new firm. Now, not only did the guy uproot his life to move to work for Lyle, he would find out that the pay was actually far less than what he was promised. So, of course, it left him, as well as other Princeton recruits, angry, to say the least. Now, little brother Eric... At first, he didn't spend much money, in comparison to Lyle, that is. So he would get himself a $50,000 Jeep, you know, pretty fair. And he hired himself a legit tennis coach for $127,000 a year. And he would get himself his own Rolex and started dressing in designer clothes. And then things fell off the rails a little bit for Eric because his love for tennis began to wane in comparison to his new love for gambling. And spoiler alert... He ended up losing a ton of money, so so much so that it scared him back into tennis. And at this point in the story, he would book himself a flight to the Middle East to play in a competition. Now, remember, Eric had a dream of going pro, but after the murders, that dream was all but lost. And he never did go to UCLA like he had planned to do. And I guess you could say for both the boys, it was kind of hard finding the motivation to excel in all these new ventures that they were getting into when there was a party every night and more money than they knew what to do with. And interestingly, the Menendez brothers never did move out of that house. You know, that same house. I think that normal people would if they had the resources. Obviously, the boys do and would never step into a house where their parents were brutally murdered again. And don't forget, this is by the mob, right? Weren't they the ones that expressed how frightened they were that the mob would come back to kill them? You know, just eyebrow-raising stuff. Although, they would rent condos in Marina del Rey, which is this really upscale seaside community, so they could host parties. So the two brothers pretty much kept themselves occupied with living the high life and Lord knows what degenerate things that comes with young, rich boys with no one to tell them what to do. And here, I guess I would ask the other question, right? Why did the boys do it? Why did they kill their parents? If you looked at the rate that they were spending, you say to yourself, it's for the money, right? But not so fast. That is actually the ultimate question in this case, whether the boys you believe should rot in jail forever or did Jose and Kitty harbor a deep, dark secret? So Jose's life insurance paid the boys another $5 million on top of everything, and they burned through the first million in quick fashion. They just couldn't spend enough of it. And Lyle and Eric's immense spending of the family fortune in that first six months really caught the attention of detectives. The motive seemed apparent now. The brothers had the most to gain in their parents' death. Little things started to stick out to detectives. One thing was they remembered that Lyle and Eric used to call them all the time, every day, to ask how the investigation was going, if they caught the murder or how they were doing. Now they realize, wait, they haven't heard from the boys in quite some time now. Did they no longer care how the case was going anymore? And they realized they had been biased. They fucked up. 
Not only did they not check the boys that night for gunpowder residue, they basically wrote them off as suspects. If they had just run a simple check on the boys' backgrounds, their whereabouts in the past couple of days from the murders, they would have discovered, as they are discovering now, that the boys had gone down to San Diego, used fake IDs to purchase two shotguns just two days before the murders. Even Jose's computer, which was just innocuous before. Now, upon further inspection, had been professionally wiped. And they were able to find the technician that wiped it. And what he told police, it was really eerie. He said that he was really scared being inside that house just one week after the Menendez murders. And that Lyle Menendez hired him personally to come erase the computer, also asking him to make it appear as though the computer had never been erased, in which he told Lyle, well, that part, I can't do that. So future monks here in the editing room, and I completely forgot to tell you guys why it's actually significant that this computer is erased, is because Lyle thought that his father's final will, the one that he cut the boys out of, was in this computer, so he wanted to have it wiped so that no one would ever see that they weren't supposed to inherit all this money. They also learned that Kitty was abusing drugs and alcohol, a possible coping mechanism for Jose's abuse and his numerous extramarital affairs. She was also seeing her own therapist at the time, and they uncovered that it wasn't just Jose that she was worried about. She was also worried about her sons to the point where she would lock herself in her room so that they couldn't get in. She described her sons as sociopaths to her therapist. They would also talk to Eric's good friend Craig. You remember, that's the boy that wrote that crazy script with him in high school. Well, when talking to detectives, Craig revealed that two months after the killings, Eric had confessed to him that he and Lyle had killed their parents. It was a friend of mine that called me and said, dude, turn on the TV. My first instinct was to, to call Eric and get to Eric and find out what happened. We went back to the house and, and eventually sat down at a chessboard. And he looked up from the chessboard and as he had his fingers on the pieces, he said, do you want to know what happened? And I made a big mistake and said yes. I can remember him telling me where the blood and skin landed and, and literally being in the room where it happened. It was a, a very intense, heavy moment. I realized that conversation was going to change my life and change his life. And, you know, he had now burdened me with something that I was stuck with a, a pretty heavy moral dilemma. To which the police said, you got to get Eric to lunch again, but this time you're gonna wear a wire. So Craig, while wearing a wire now, got Eric to go to lunch with him again, try to coax him to confess once again, but this time Eric didn't bite. It appeared that Eric regretted ever telling Craig that dark secret, and now was completely denying that he even said it. I would wager a guess that his older brother Lyle had gotten to him, probably berated him for telling their dark secret because we know for a fact that during this time, Eric was not dealing with the fact that he murdered his parents. He wasn't dealing with it very well. His mental state was shaky at best, and he was trying to preoccupy his time with activities such as tennis and partying, but over time, it was wearing on him. And soon, he was buried in guilt. And this is when he visited his therapist, Dr. Jerome Ozeal. So Dr. Ozeal, from the start of this particular session, could see that Eric was distraught. You know, Eric said that he's been so stressed that it gave him ulcers. There was definitely something weighing heavily on Eric's mind that he was not letting the doctor know. And the doctor could see that they were on the brink of a breakthrough. Dr. Ozeal decided maybe a change of scenery right, would help ease the anxiety. And so they went outside, took a walk in the park. They had small talk along the way and it was just what Eric needed to open up. Because once they got back to the office, Eric confessed everything to Dr. Ozeal that he and his brother killed his parents and pretty much spared no details. He would also tell Dr. Ozeal that he was very scared 
of Lyle. That if Lyle were to find out that he was telling Dr. Ozil all this stuff, that his brother would kill him. Now, now Dr. Ozil listened and he struggled with his own oath, you know, of patient confidentiality because this this is this is a very high profile case. You know, it was national news, and here he was in his office confessing to the killings. And now, a couple of days later, on November 2nd, Dr. Ozil would request to see both the brothers together. Now, Lyle arrived, still not knowing that his little brother Eric had already confessed everything to Dr. Ozil. And the doctor had his own little secret that he was keeping. This time around, he was going to record the entire session. His plan was to confront Lyle with the knowledge that Eric had told him everything about killing their parents and just in case things might get out of hand, maybe Lyle gets violent. Dr. Ozil had his mistress. Yes, the woman he was cheating on his wife with. She was standing just outside the door, ready to call the police if need be. And her name is Judalon Smith, and she will actually play another pivotal role in this case as well. Keep her in mind. And so, when Lyle found out that Eric had told Dr. Ozio everything like Dr. Ozio expected, Lyle was incredibly furious. He went as far as to threaten to kill Dr. Ozil if he told anyone. And you would think this would be the final meeting that the boys would have with this particular doctor, but no. He would actually go on to have a few more sessions afterwards, and Dr. Ozil would record all of them. And it turns out that for Lyle, you know, the guilt was compounding as well, and his front was clearly a facade, just like Eric's was, because he began to talk about the Calabasas robberies and how his father made him feel incredibly stupid. Eric said that his father's disinheritance of the boys was the main reason that they killed their parents. And just know that Dr. Ozio, he had every intention to be true to the boys. He was not planning on betraying them whatsoever with these tapes. But good old Dr. Ozio's love life would actually come into play <laughs> right now. The only person he was really betraying was his wife, of course, right? Betraying her with Judalon. Well, Judalon would also feel betrayed when Dr. Ozil tried to break up with her. She goes crazy. She went to the police station and told them that Dr. Ozil was abusing her. And oh, you might want to check out this safety deposit box. You might find some recordings there of the Menendez brothers. Very interesting. So the police confiscated the tapes and they listened intently. On March 8th of 1990, Lyle was pulling out of his driveway when a swarm of cops surrounded his car, pulled him out, laid him on the ground and handcuffed him. And where was Eric? He actually was nowhere to be found. And it turns out that he had already left the country, but only so he could enter a tennis tournament in Israel. While there, he would receive a phone call from the States from Lyle's attorney to inform him that Lyle had been arrested and that he needed to catch the first flight back. And once Eric got off that phone, people in the room with him said that he started to cry uncontrollably. And on March 11th of 1990, Eric was arrested at LAX. So it was over for the Menendez brothers at this point. So at the arraignment, the boys were described as coming into court, appearing as though they had no worries in the world, that they weren't about to be charged with killing their parents for financial gain. And it turns out that they were sticking with the mob hit story and they pled not guilty. And the boys were well loved enough that their own family was still firmly behind them. Their grandmother, Jose's own mother, Maria, still believed that it was a mafia hit. But what can anybody say when those tapes of Dr. Ozil is released. But those tapes of the boys confessing became a highly contested issue, and it took the Supreme Court to bring down the ruling. And unfortunately for the boys, there was a loophole, because in the initial recording, Lyle had threatened Dr. Ozil's life. So because of that, it violated the agreement. And two of the three recordings were admissible in court, and one of those tapes 
had Lyle's confession on it. And knowing this, because of those tapes, Lyle and Eric's attorneys, well, they needed another angle for the boys. Because the prosecution had the boys dead to rights with those tapes. And once the case went to trial in 1993, the angle that the boys' defense team took caught everybody off guard. And this was a nationally televised case, so you can say it caught the entire nation off guard. The Menendez defense team explained to America that the boys had killed their parents in self-defense. They were in fear of their lives. The boys felt that it was only a matter of time before the parents killed them because of a deep, dark family secret. So the boys had the best attorney money could buy in a woman named Leslie Abramson. And she argued that the boys outwardly appeared to have the perfect life, but behind closed doors, it was the complete opposite. Their father, Jose Enrique Menendez, ruled his family with an iron fist and had impossible expectations for the boys. He was a demeaning man that verbally and physically abused his boys since birth. He was a philanderer. He cheated on their mother countless times. And Kitty, their mother, enabled Jose to be this monster to the boys. She didn't have any interest in being a good wife or a good mother. She basically spent her time getting drunk and hopped up on some form of drugs. She knew Jose was with other women, but didn't do anything about it. She knew Jose was hurting the boys and didn't protect them. She was accused of blaming the boys for ruining her non-existing broadcasting career and threatened to kill them constantly. She was a professional victim that always threatened suicide. Then Abramson laid down the bombshell. Both Jose and Kitty were sexually abusing both Lyle and Eric since the boys were little. Did you see any um, indication in uh, Eric Menendez's medical records of uh, an injury to his uh, throat area? Yes. The direct quote is hurt posterior pharynx, uvula, and soft palate. Uh, senior emergency room, Princeton Medical Center. Okay. Healing well, symptomatic treatment. Actually, it was seen the day before. This is the follow-up note. And is that consistent with, uh, or that, could that be caused by child sexual abuse, in your opinion? Yes, could be. And, and what, do you have any opinion as to what type of child sexual abuse could have resulted in that particular complaint? Uh, oral copulation. Were there any um, physical findings at all on physical inspection, not only of the anal area, but any place else on the body? There were a few non-specific scars, and there was one scar on the uh, lower lip that appeared to be a non-sutured scar. Did you see uh, in the medical history uh, certain injuries which had been uh, treated by other physicians? Yes. For instance, was there uh, an indi indication that when Lyle Menendez was three years old on March 9, 1971, that he had a uh, injury sutured as a result of a, a dog biting him in the face? Yes, I recall that, I believe. And do you recall in 1974, there was a report of an injury to a uh, hematoma to the left side of his face? Yes. And in the same year, 1974, when he was six years old, a report of an injury of a one and a half laceration to his right eyebrow? Yes. Was there also a history that he had what's called an epigastric hernia when he was seven years old? Yes. What is that? It's a uh, failure of the muscles of the abdomen to completely, uh, to be completely contiguous so that a small part of bowel uh, comes out between the muscles, essentially. Right. And did the medical history also include a history in August of 1976 of a speech articulation disorder and below grade level school performance? Yes. Did it also include uh, an entry on August 4th, 1978 that he grinds his teeth? I believe, I don't remember the exact date of the gr teeth grinding, but I remember the teeth grinding. And were there also, um, was there also a report in 19, uh, October 28th, 1976 of stomach pains? Yes. 
And on March 7, 1977, global headaches. Yes. Uh, was there also a various reports from 1979 <laughs> to 1989 of uh, complaints of headaches? Yes. Would any doctor looking at that full range of symptoms been alerted to the possibility of sexual abuse just looking at this medical history if it was all presented at once? And at some point in time, when the boys were young, the brothers began discussing things and Eric started telling Lyle about what father had been doing to him. He would stick things in me as he was giving me oral sex or at times he would just sit on the bed with his legs up uh, um, spread and with his back to the to the back of the bed and he would have me give him oral, me oral sex and he would stick the needles or the tacks into my thighs uh, as he was doing this. Did he also use a knife at any time during, and, and these were the incidents that you've come to call rough sex? Yes. And did he also use a knife at any time? Mm -hmm. Yes, he would. Uh, he had this wooden kitchen knife that he would use to just, he wouldn't be doing anything with sex at that point though. He would just have me sit on the back of the bed. He would put a towel under my legs and he would just cut my, my thighs with the knife. And have you, do you have a, a scar that you, is still visible on your thigh from what he, when he did that? Yes. Which thigh is it? My left thigh. And how long is this scar? It's about that long. And do you recall that that's something that was done during one of these episodes? Yes. When you were 10 years old, how old was Eric? He was 12 and a half. He asked me if uh, my dad ever gave me massages. He was actually trying to find out if any of these massages were normal. And I, my response to him was that I wouldn't know. I didn't have a father around. My parents were divorced then. And uh, I really couldn't help him. What did he say about where the massages were? Well, he told me his father was massaging his dick. He used that word? Yes, he did. What uh, I do remember very specifically was him asking me to make a promise to him never to reveal that to anybody. And uh, he was saying it very seriously and I took it very seriously. He explained to me that the, these massages that his father was giving him were beginning to hurt. And do you remember whether or not you understood what that meant or? I definitely didn't understand. He didn't tell you anything about tacks or needles or ropes or anything No, like he that. didn't. Were you familiar with uh, a nickname that your cousin Eric used to refer to himself at about this same time? Yes, I did. And what was that nickname? It was Hurt Man. Lyle said that he threatened his dad, you know, to stop doing this to Eric or he'll tell someone about it. Jose allegedly responded, he's my son. I'll do whatever I want with him. Eric would reveal that his mother would give him what she called genital exams now and again until he was 15 years old. She would walk around completely naked, all but a open robe, and Lyle would testify that she would make him lay with her in bed and allowed him to touch her everywhere. This is the one of Lyle's nakedness, which was saved by his mother, kept in that envelope. Now, both from the cross-examination of Eric, I suppose, uh, was the first clue that the prosecution's theory is that the boys the children took the naked pictures. And somehow that theory, I think, has to do with some kind of visual perspective that they want you to speculate about based on the height of the person who took the picture. Now, that's wonderful, except people who take pictures can bend down and take pictures of little children's genitals, even if they're big people, even if they're grown-ups. But frankly, there is absolute hard proof that Eric Menendez did not take this nasty picture of his brother. And here is the proof. The 
if I have it mispl misplaced it. Okay. Here it is. The proof sheet is the proof. The sequence of the photographs. Here is a gathering of people. Here is Lyle in the bathtub. One can assume the morning of the birthday party. And here is Eric in bed. Now, Eric is in bed when this naked picture of Lyle is being taken. See, here's the next picture on the roll. Now, are we supposed to believe that six-year-old Eric, who testified he was not allowed to handle a camera until he was 12 or 13, got out of bed to go take a naked picture of his brother and then got back into bed so someone could take a picture waking him up? And it isn't until way down here on the roll that the naked picture of Eric shows up, and then a picture of Mrs. Menendez's favorite thing. Now, I think almost as amazing as the fact that these pictures were taken was that these pictures were saved. You will see the envelope that they came in, and you will see the negatives, and you will see the original small photos, and you will see Kitty Menendez's handwriting that was on the envelope these photos were in, which says Eric's birthday, November 1976. She saw these photographs, and she kept them. And because of these terrible secrets, their parents would threaten their lives all the time if, you know, this information ever got out. Kitty is said to have threatened to poison the boy's food, which made every family meal even that more awkward thereafter. You know, another thing for the boys to be fearful of, to go along with their nights, you know, being in fear of their father slipping into their beds. And after four months of heartbreaking testimony, pretty much, on January of 1994, the case finally came to a close. And it took the jury almost one month of deliberation here. And we could only imagine it was a, a never-ending back and forth between the jurors because it is such an emotional case. And interestingly, literally, all the females wanted to acquit and all the males wanted to convict so it leaves us with a hung jury, a mistrial. And so the second trial would be scheduled for October of 1995. And this time, the media would not be allowed in. You know, there would be no spectacle to be made of this case. Prosecutor David Kahn promised a different approach to the case. It's one thing that we have asked the judge to do is to limit the so-called abuse excuse, to limit evidence that has nothing to do with this case. And so all the rulings from the first trial changed in the state's favor. There were various instructional issues. There was expert testimony that wasn't permitted in the second trial. The sexual abuse evidence that had been admitted at the first trial for the defense was no longer admissible. The judge has ruled that he will not allow the brothers to call all of their family and friends as witnesses, curtailing the defense's case. And in fact, what they didn't allow the jury to hear made it worse because the defense evidence that was presented was so uh, trivial. So we don't hear that Lyle, when he was eight years old, told Diane that his father was touching his penis. We don't hear that Lyle, when he was 12 or 13, wrote an essay about a father put on death row from molesting his child. What we do hear is that his father didn't put a Band-Aid on his knee. The prosecutor was able to stand up in closing and say, you've heard no evidence of sexual abuse. And the prosecutor was right, but only because he had excluded the evidence. And again, they needed almost a month to deliberate. But the jurors this time had agreed on a verdict. They found Eric and Lyle guilty of two counts of first-degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. The death penalty was mercifully removed from the table because prior to the murders, the brothers had no history of violence. And so they were sentenced to a life without the possibility of parole on July 2nd of 1996. The Menendez brothers, they do care a lot about each other. They love each other, they're brothers. And they've been the one constant for each other through the hard times. You know, if you believe all the accusations, then they clearly have a bond that is probably unbreakable. So before they are sent off to prison, they place a request to be put in the same prison so that they could be together. But that was denied. So on September 10th of 1996, the brothers waved to each other one last time, and that would be the last time they would see each other. 
Now, this takes us to present day times as the brothers' defense attorneys filed a habeas petition in 2023 claiming new evidence of abuse by their father. The evidence includes a letter Eric allegedly wrote to his cousin and a sworn declaration by a former member of that band, Menudo, Roy Rossio. Y al momento me ofrecieron una copa de vino. Yo tenía 13 años. Ricardo no acostumbraba a servir bebidas alcohólicas. También hay ese punto. José Menéndez me dijo, toma este vino. Es un vino carísimo. Y tómate toda la taza. Después que yo me la tomé, yo me comencé a sentir un cansancio, un peso. Yo no podía más moverme. Yo no podía reaccionar porque eso me estaba tomando cuenta de mi cuerpo. Me drogaron. Y después de eso, yo amanecí en el hotel. ¿Cómo yo llegué al hotel? Yo no sé. Pero... Cuando yo fui al baño, I was bleeding. Y yo estuve una semana con un dolor terrible. Con un dolor que no podía más, no me podía ni mover. Yo me acuerdo que yo tenía que simular que yo no estaba con dolor, pero el dolor estaba tomando cuenta de mi vida. Era un dolor terrible. Y sangré muchísimo. Y yo le mostré a Carlos, mire Carlos, mi ano se está sangrando. On October 24th of 2024, Los Angeles County District Attorney George Gascon recommended that Eric and Lyle be resentenced for the 1989 murders of their parents. How this works is the brothers will now go before a Los Angeles Superior Court judge for a final decision on whether to resentence them, and that date is set for November 25th, which I Google constantly. And I found possibly that the date was moved to December 11. If they are resentenced, they could see a path in which they can actually be free again. Now, the two brothers were sentenced to two life terms behind bars without the possibility of parole for these murders. But society over the decades developed a soft spot. But like I mentioned from the top, there's a new DA in town that quoted crime is illegal again, which basically pertains to how California has lost the plot when it came to criminals, you know, for a long time now. Which makes me wonder if the brothers resentencing here might be happening at quite the inopportune time in California, which has been considered to be, you know, soft. But now... California is experiencing some type of shift on how Californians view criminals. They're basically sick and tired of the break-ins and the slaps on the wrist for it. At least, that's what the recent elections suggest with their new DA and a certain Prop 36, which basically states that people convicted of certain drug or theft crimes could receive increased Punishment. Now, if you ever get a chance to look deeper into Prop 36, which I did, you'll find that it can get really serious for repeat offenders. For example, drug dealers can be charged for murder, depending on what drugs they're selling, like fentanyl. And then there's these other crimes that used to be considered misdemeanors, you know, like that famous, you know, break your car window with a, what was it, a spark plug? Those four repeat offenders can now be upped to a felony with three years behind bars. It used to be that anything under $950 in damage, you just get a slap on the wrist. But now, those are all arrestable offenses with jail time. Now, of course, don't take some YouTuber's word that the people of California are sick of it, because are they? Well, take a look at this overwhelming margin of victory for Prop 36. And I figure that the 30% that voted no never had someone break into their house before or 
are the ones that want to keep breaking into your house. So yes, if California is starting to lean this way and the Menendez brothers case is in California. If I had to predict the outcome of the Menendez brothers resentencing, I think they'll basically spend the rest of their days in jail.